Loyalty alone wasn't enough to win the Seven Years' War, but the patriotic resilience of his army did buy Frederick just enough time to prevail. Ultimately, he was saved by a stroke of luck. In 1762, with Prussia's forces all but spent, Tsarina Elizabeth, ruler of Russia, died. Her passing was celebrated in Berlin as the miracle of Brandenburg. Her successor, Grand Duke Peter, was an ardent admirer of Frederick. Russia's days in the anti-Prussian coalition were numbered. The Seven Years' War would soon be over, and its end inaugurated 23 years of peaceful Frederician rule. In the second half of his reign, diplomacy, realpolitik, and the first partition of Poland would bring Frederick more new territory than he'd gained through war. At home, he worked tirelessly to build the progressive state he had outlined in the Anti-Machiavel, a vision that survives today in the architecture at the very center of Berlin. Frederick had initially intended that this square should be your bog-standard European residential square. That meant at one end there'd be a palace, and then extending from each wing a royal opera house and a royal library. But what Frederick did was something completely radical. He subtracted the palace from this ensemble, and instead you had an opera on one side, a freestanding library opposite, and over in the corner, St. Hedwig's Cathedral. Work on this cathedral began in 1745, after the king got back from the Silesian Wars. And St. Hedwig was the patron saint of Silesia. This was to be a cathedral for the Catholic subjects of a Protestant kingdom. It was one thing to tolerate the existence of a religious minority within the borders of your kingdom. That was not uncommon in 18th century Europe. But to establish a building like this as a projection of tolerance as a value in its own right, that was a highly distinctive and unusual gesture. In characteristic, absolutist fashion, the king intervened personally in every area of state policy, public education, the civil service, law, agriculture, trade and industry. Er war ein absoluter Herrscher, das auf alle Fälle, aber er war natürlich genauso aufgeklärt Und ich denke, gerade Friedrich II. zeigt, dass beides tatsächlich auch zu machen geht. Zum Beispiel hat er die Folter abgeschafft. Er hat für religiöse Toleranz äh, propagiert. Er hat ja auch in gewisser Weise die Zensur in Preußen abgeschafft. Und er hat tatsächlich reformerische Ideen angeregt und dann auch umgesetzt. Das größte und beste Beispiel ist garantiert die Justizreform. Conceived during his last years and published in 1794, eight years after his death, this is perhaps Frederick's greatest domestic achievement, a comprehensive law code which redefined the relationship between the monarchy and the state. The law code envisaged a world of free citizens in which the state was sovereign and kings and governments were bound by law. Almost 20,000 paragraphs legislate for every conceivable transaction between one Prussian and another. Before there was a general law code, the law was embodied in an endless plethora of edicts and decrees. With the law code, suddenly you had transparency, you had glasnost. Frederick's achievements made him a cult figure throughout Europe but the king himself shunned personal adulation. In his last 20 years, he withdrew almost entirely from his capital. A cranky old man, most likely to be glimpsed walking his beloved greyhounds at Sanssouci. With the exception of a few coins and medallions, this is the only image which Frederick of Prussia deliberately propagated of himself. And it's a portrait by Johann Heinrich Christoph Franke. 
The king shown here is not a glorious or powerful figure. He's effectively an old man. We see a tired old man. He turns towards us a face bearing all the marks of age. Cheeks are sunken, the lips have fallen. He's clearly lost all his teeth. And it really is remarkable that it's by this image that this king wanted to be remembered. What it really is is a fascinating document, which I think captures the king's sense of who he himself was. He perceived himself, I think, as a man whose energies had been consumed by long years of war and long years of work for his subjects, for his kingdom, for the Prussian state. Frederick the Great died, aged 74, in his armchair on 17th of August, 1786. He had built a progressive, cultured, and militarized state. There was no enigma. We're surrounded by what are often called the arts of peace, and it might seem impossible to imagine that the man who led his armies is also the man who designed and financed this extraordinary palace of Sanssouci. Is this a paradox? I don't think so. It certainly was not a paradox for Frederick. For Frederick, it was all part of the sort of Gesamtkunstwerk, the, the total work of art that was his life. He was an intensely aesthetic man who thought through everything that he did in an aesthetic as well as a political and philosophical way. This cultivation of the arts, of music, of conversation, of philosophy, and of reasoned, rational statecraft, they were all cut from one cloth. There was no paradox here between the Frederick who played the flute and the Frederick who led armies. These two worlds flow together in Frederick's existence and become one. The contradiction is dissolved. Most young Germans know next to nothing of Frederick the Great. Even here in Berlin, where the echoes of his memory are everywhere. You don't have to look too hard to find Frederick's presence in the German capital today. But among the people, he's a distant, largely forgotten figure. The memory of his deeds buried by the sheer scale and weight of Germany's subsequent triumphs and traumas. In the late 19th century, Prussia rose under the leadership of Otto von Bismarck to become the political heartland of a single German nation. A Hohenzollern descendant of Frederick's family, Kaiser Wilhelm II, led this unified Germany into the horrors of World War I. But it was in the 1930s that Frederick the Great's Prussia would be most emphatically appropriated as a model for the future of Germany. <laughs> 